good morning and welcome to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide Macaulay. The headlines. Talks in Istanbul on extending Ukraine grain deal appearing to end without Russian agreement to extend the Black Sea deal. Britain says it's supplying Ukraine with long-range cruise missiles. Plus, Ukrainian authorities say eight civilians have been injured in a Russian strike on a village near Zaporizhia. And Russia also vowed to adequate responses after a report on the UK arms to Ukraine. But we'll begin where the Ukrainian authorities say eight civilians have been injured in a Russian strike on a village near Zaporizhia. Now, the Zaporizhia regional governor wrote on Telegram that cluster munitions fired from multiple rocket launches injured eight people, including three ambulance workers that responded to a call. Natalia Marchenko, whose house was completely destroyed in the strike, said that a fire broke out in her yard after she heard a second salvo of explosions. Elsewhere, Ukraine's emergency services reported that one woman died in Russian missile strike in the city of Slovyansk in the eastern region of Donetsk. Authorities noted that the woman died from her injuries in the hospital. Ukraine, Russia, Turkey and the United Nations have discussed UN proposals to extend a deal allowing the safe Black Sea export of Ukraine grain, which Moscow has threatened to quit on May the 18th over obstacles to its own grain and fertilizer exports. The meeting of senior officials in Istanbul appeared to end without Russian agreement to extend the Black Sea deal. The Kremlin said Russian President Vladimir Putin could speak with the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, at short notice, if needed, regarding an extension of the deal, but there were no such plans at present. UK Defence Minister Ben Wallace says Britain is supplying Ukraine with storm shadow long-range cruise missiles, which will allow Ukraine's forces to hit Russian troops, ammunition and fuel dumps deep behind the front line. Ukraine has been asking for months for long-range missiles, but support provided by Britain and other allies, such as the United States, has previously been limited to shorter-range weapons. Mr. Wallace says Britain was providing these weapons to Ukraine so they could be used within its sovereign territory. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I've said many times in the past, we simply will not stand by while Russia kills civilians. We've seen what Ukrainians can do when they have the right capabilities. Today I can confirm that the UK is donating Storm Shadow missiles to Ukraine. Storm Shadow is a long-range, conventional-only precision strike capability. It complements the long-range systems already gifted, including HIMARS and Harpoon missiles, as well as Ukraine's own Neptune cruise missile and longer-range missions elsewhere gifted. The donation of these weapon systems gives Ukraine the best chance to defend themselves against Russia's continued brutality. Ukraine has a right to be able to defend itself against this. The use of Storm Shadow will allow Ukraine to push back Russian forces based within Ukrainian sovereign territory. I'm sure the House will understand that I'm not going to further details of the capabilities, but while these weapons will give Ukraine new capability, members should recognise that these systems are not even in the same league as the Russian AS-24 Killjoy hypersonic missile or Shahed Iranian one-way Drak drones or even the Caliber cruise missile with a range of over 2,000 kilometres, roughly seven times that of a Storm Shadow missile. Russia must recognise that their actions alone have led to such systems being provided to Ukraine. It is my judgment as a Defence Secretary that this is a calibrated and proportionate response to Russia's escalations. Meanwhile, the Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov says Britain's move to supply missiles to Ukraine will require an adequate response from the Russian military. Britain and other Western countries have scaled up their military aid for Ukraine this year. UK Defence Minister Ben Wallace and the Foreign Minister James Cleverly had been in the United States for talks on supporting Ukraine in recent weeks. The conflict in Ukraine is at a turning point, with Kyiv expected to unleash its new counteroffensive after six months of keeping its forces 
on the defensive, while Russia mounted a huge winter offensive that failed to capture significant territory. Lawmakers have accused the Pentagon of effectively undermining war crimes prosecution of Russia by blocking the sharing of military intelligence of the U.S. with the International Criminal Court at The Hague. U.S. Senator Dick Durbin, a Democrat, said at a Senate hearing that he'd been told by the ICC's chief prosecutor, Kareem Khan, that the U.S. Department of Justice and State were both cooperating. But the Department of Defense, under the leadership of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, was refusing. The European Commission's top internal affairs official has said during a visit to Kyiv that the EU has not observed any significant smuggling of weapons into Europe from wartime Ukraine. But Johansson said that some individual cases of small arms being taken out of Ukraine have been recorded, adding that they were mostly individuals attempting to take weapons out as trophies or for personal protection. She says the issue of arms smuggling had been high on the list of topics discussed in a meeting with the Ukrainian Interior Minister, Alexander Klimenko. We have not seen it yet. Uh, I must say that. We have not seen any uh, industrial smuggling of firearms out of Ukraine. But of course, we know by uh, experience that war is a catastrophe for citizens, but it's an opportunity for criminals. We have not seen uh, any real smuggling. Uh, we have seen a few weapons uh, that are being carried by people for pr pr personal protection, and they're being taken, of course, at the, uh, by the border guards. Some have bring uh, a weapon as a trophy. <laughs> Uh, trying to, to but that no no real smuggling and of course these weapons are being seized uh, they're not allowed to take them in yeah, four million ukrainians are currently protected by the temper protection directive in our member states and this figure has been stable for one year now we see ukrainians returning back to ukraine but we also see some new coming and register but the overall figures has been more or less stable for for one year of course it's for the each individual ukraine Ukrainian citizen to decide there should be good opportunities to go back and there should be good opportunities to stay. So I think that is, uh, and, and people are in different also personal situations that could uh, lead to different situations. To financial aid, Ukraine Finance Minister Sehi Marchenko says Kyiv has received $16.7 billion in financial aid from its Western allies so far this year. The minister commented, during a meeting that included finance ministers and central bankers from G7 countries. He thanked those participating for their unprecedented efforts to mobilize the financing. Ukraine faces a $38 billion deficit this year, and the government is also asking for another $14 billion to reconstruct critical infrastructure and the energy sector. Now let's talk to Mr. Yin Kao, Energy International Affairs Analyst, joining us from East Midlands in the UK. Good morning and thank you for being with us again today. Good morning. My first point of interest will be this supply of the long-range cruise missiles from the UK to Ukraine. Given that their first uh, uh, refusal not to do so was predicated on the fact that they don't want these missiles to be launched into Russian territory, thus being in a definite escalation. But it seems to me that they're not shy of doing that anymore. What are your thoughts? Well, the, the war moved to the skies about three months ago, and we can also try to trace uh, the trajectory. So it started with uh, interceptions of uh, different, uh, 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 if you like, warfighter jets. Uh, uh, of the Black Sea, uh, the Baltic, uh, the Russian jets, uh, the US jets intercepted, uh, the British jets intercepted. So the war moved to the skies a very long time ago, all right? All of these uh, maneuvers were there. However, uh, Ukraine started to have the upper hand about um, six weeks ago when it started to launch its own drones, drones armed with missiles, and they were able to take out uh, tanks, Russian tanks on the ground. So this is a reinforcement of moving the war from the grounds to the skies. It's going to the skies net. Uh, Russia also by itself has been uh, 
conducting several drills, air drills, okay, over the Black Sea and all of that. So this, uh, giving these missiles to Ukraine at this time is timely, is to reinforce its own air armament, if you like. And it's also supposed to send a signal to Russia that, uh, well, the rest of the world is waiting for you when we move from the ground. Uh, there was a law, okay, in trying to capture more lands. And of course, uh, uh, Russia had to uh, uh, dig up uh, its own, around its own soldiers so that Ukraine would not be able to uh, get at them. So the war is no longer fought on the ground. There are more tanks for Ukraine on the ground. You remember that Leopard uh, tanks were, were sent about three, four weeks ago from Germany, and I think uh, UK also got approval for that. Uh, so at this time, it's, it's moved to the skies. Ukraine is winning that war using drones. Russia able to record a few wins, if you like. But sending this uh, air armament to uh, Ukraine at this time uh, reinforces its uh, dominance in the air and also sends a, a signal to Russia. I watched your um, report uh, where the Minister for the Secretary for Defense of, uh, of Britain, Ben Wallace, was trying to justify sending uh, the air missiles. It just tells you uh, that uh, Ukraine is being held to account to say that as much as possible, you have this missile, it should be used uh, to defend your own territory and not to uh, attack Russia in its own uh, country. So yes, it's come, it's reinforced uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, armament in the air, and it's left to be seen how Russia intends to respond to this. Can you imagine, Mr. Yenigi, a worst case scenario where these storm shadow long range cruise missiles find themselves find their way close to the Kremlin, near the Kremlin, anywhere be beyond the front lines. Can you imagine how so this, yeah, can you imagine how, how, how much of an escalation this will be? To which Peskov has said that there will be an appropriate response. This is the feeling of uh, the Brazilian president who's been speaking recently, Lula da Silva, that sending these weapons is not helping in any way to bring about peace talks. It's a lot of grandstanding. I don't think peace talks will end this war. Uh, we've crossed that divide uh, much long ago. And there are implications for us to understand that peace talks won't end it. Uh, so I'll give you some instances, which I don't know if, if they have been considered publicly. Now, Kremlin reports uh, about two weeks ago that there was an assassination attempt on uh, the Russian president, okay, right there in Kremlin, that there were two drones that were armed with missiles to take him out there. I don't think that happened. I think what necessarily happened was that uh, so sometimes in, in war, warring parties cause uh, damage to themselves by themselves, almost like an implosion to blame uh, the uh, opposition party or to blame the other party. I think that that was masterminded by Russia itself in its own territory. Uh, does Putin have internal enemies? He does have. Could they have been responsible for trying to take him out? Very much so, it's a possibility. However, there cannot be any doubt, because Ukraine is still, is now, uh, has the support of, of, of NATO okay, and the Western nations, which have treaties guarding uh, even the use of uh, missiles in times of war. So Ukraine will never make that mistake. It will be it's traceable, okay? It's not something that would not, if, if it happens, you'll be able to investigate and find out if exactly the missile was launched from Ukraine to uh, into Kremlin itself in Russia. So Ukraine would never make that mistake. Take note of what Ben Wally said. He said as much as possible that Ukraine has shown that it can def what it can do defending its own territory when given the right support. That is a tacit instruction to say you receive these missiles, you have the responsibility of being responsible in the deployment of those missiles. So, the, I mean, we can draw a line under that that Ukraine will never fire missiles at Russia, not at this stage until we now say, okay, we have a full-scale world war on our hands. And that's not going to happen. But it also does not preclude Russia from continuing to attack targets in its own domain to blame Ukraine. So I don't even think we should start to envisage that Russia, uh, Ukraine will fire uh, missiles into Russia and then uh, we start waiting to see what would happen. That's full-scale war. And I don't think that it will happen. But hasn't that horse already left the stable? Hasn't that ship sailed? Aren't we already at full-scale war? It could get worse, and that's why 
uh, they, the countries, including UK, were saying that they weren't going to supply these long-range missiles to Ukraine. One of the things some of the military um, experts have spoken about is the unpredictable nature of war. So just to say that they won't use it, except they are provoked to strike deeper into Russian territory, will be presumptuous. I don't think it's a provocation. It's not as as, as bad as saying, um, forgive me to use this analogy, that you cannot trust Trump with uh, uh, nuclear missiles, that he may just get angry. Forgive me that I use that analogy. That's not at play here. Now, the implications of the war are clear. And you highlighted a couple of them in your very comprehensive report this morning. It's got implications on the world economy. It's got imp on implications of, of, of food security. It's got implications on even military might. You discover, I mean, in a sense, it looks like all of these countries had invested so much in military work only to waste them on a whim. It's, it's a war that is going on to two years only because of one man who does not even have local support of his own people to go to war. No, we are not at the scale of a world war that can be imagined or be toiled with. We are not there yet. Everybody is saying, as much as possible, we must be able to transport relief supplies. We must be able to move food around. Because it's not just the loss of lives, primarily, that will be the impact of war. We are talking about its implications on several other sectors. The rest of the world will feel it. Okay? The allies are not even started coming together just as of yet. I can tell you that for a fact. If we ever get into a full-scale war, we are talking about military, military domains all over the world. We are talking about military bases. And we have a couple of foreign military bases in Africa itself. It means Africa should be sitting up to say, now we have to get prepared. We have a couple of situations that would Im get impacted in varying degrees when we get a full-scale war. Uh, uh, China has not publicly come out to say, I am supporting uh, uh, Russia with measles are just here. Japan, Taiwan, and all of those countries along those regions that regularly get the support of the United States have not even come into this war yet. Are we going to try to nip it in the bud? Is a reasonable thing to do? Would that mean just discussing peace? No, because the world order is moving, it's changing, and the rest of the world is uh, uh, calculating where this uh, puts their nations all over the world. We are not at full-scale war yet. Make no mistake about that. But the implications of the war in Ukraine can be seen as of present and what can be envisaged in months to come. Now, the uh, counteroffensive that is being touted has been set by the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to be on hold. Well, he didn't give a time frame, but he says that going now or going in a, in a, in a manner that they're unprepared will mean that they will suffer a lot of casualties. Now, that being said, it also means that the Russians even have more ample time to prepare. You remember that with the Bakhmut situation and the Wagner mercenaries who are complaining and who, because of whom the Chechen group uh, was, or, were asking the Russian defense uh, people that they'd want to replace Wagner at Bakhmut. But it appears Wagner is very necessary for the Russian invasion from that standpoint. What do you make of this counteroffensive, which some have said that it may not be a spring offensive anymore, but an autumn or maybe even worst case scenario, winter offensive? No, I don't think there's any counteroffensive that's going to happen anymore. That's not, that it's not going to come from Russia. Uh, there's no doubt about that. If it was going to happen, now is the time it should have happened. It's not when Ukraine itself is getting more support. Okay, a counteroffensive means that you want to catch Ukraine napping. It means each of the warring parties looking at the time when one of them is at its lowest head in terms of uh, military might. Those times have passed. I mean, about a month ago, we discussed this issue. Ukraine was very vulnerable, okay? That was when we were talking about winter, okay? And thinking that uh, Russia is uh, most capable of deploying onslaught during winter. That didn't happen either. We are here. Now we can count. Ukraine is, uh, sorry, Russia is counting its losses in terms of men. And even for their military parade, they can only bring out one tank back home. Only one tank. That tells you that Russia is in trouble. And there's no doubt about that. The Wagner leadership that had been tacitly uh, going against uh, uh, Putin before now is now bold enough to cast aspersions on Putin himself, talking about the fact that this war is a misadventure and all of that. So count Russia's losses. They've lost military equipment, 
they are losing uh, manpower by the day, they are losing face at home. China is not coming out in both support as was envisaged. Compare that to Ukraine's uh, position in this war, successfully defended itself over one year, has been able to get more support. Look at the amount of money they are getting. They are still selling their grain. Their grain is still going out and they are making money from that. They are getting more missiles and armament. They've not lost, but they've not lost it till date. They are still able to hold that region. And then now they are getting public support. There are more countries uh, declaring their allegiance to NATO. And that means that those countries will not stop at supporting Ukraine in this way against uh, Russia. Russia has nothing more to add at this point other than to keep going at soft targets. And the only thing that you can envisage from all of this, because it will still it will be more support for Ukraine and Russia thinking, where do we go from here? And I think that this is the end of Putin's presidency. And I give it to only maybe a couple of months, certainly not two years from now. A group of, the group of seven uh, are meeting sometime, I think, in July in Japan. And for which purpose they are saying that they want to help to pressure Russia to end the war. And they say that they will stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. But painting the picture of how this has developed for President Putin, do you think he's looking for a get out of jail card? You think he's looking for a way to end this war? at this point, given the way it's going? Or you think he was for also, the long haul? No, it's not going in for the long haul. That plan had been on the table since March. Remember, there was a visit of the Chinese president. It wasn't only to come and see anything on the ground. There was nothing for Putin to show as a, a cheek on the ground in, in, in uh, Russia. It was to say, OK, at this point, you are going to get a warrant of arrest. There's no doubt these things have happened. It's not something that you start to uh, uh, fish in the air for what the next steps will be. So he's got a warrant of arrest from the ICC. Uh, China has visited him and said to him that if he's arrested anywhere, then that may account for some kind of aggravation. So Putin himself is thought this all true. Okay, he's not going to end the war because he needs to save his face. So he's not going to say, "Oh no, we are going to end the war." But at some point, I believe that he's going to uh, just. Uh, step down from being the leader in, in Russia, because that's what it is. And then possibly say to himself that he's going into exile. He's got to leave. And I think that privately in Russia right there, he's probably thinking who is going to, uh, I think that the battle for who's going to be the next uh, leader or the leadership of Russia is already on. And Wagner recognizes that. And that's why Chenchen that you mentioned and a couple of uh, other allies in that region are eyeing that who do we, who succeeds Putin? That's what the conversation is. The whole world won't be talking about it publicly, but it is certainly being planned for privately. That, okay, so where do we go from it? Who sort of succeed Putin? He's not going to come and say, we've lost this war. He's only going to come and say that, well, he's tried his best that he could, and that discussing with China seems to be that there's a need for a regime change, but who then takes on from there? It's not for the long haul, but it's uh, the days are counting for an end to Putin's uh, leadership in Russia. Are we therefore underestimating the patriotism and the nationalist views of the Russian people who historically have always stood behind their people, even though there were uprisings that were quelled by the czars of Russia back in the day. But Putin, as um, dictatorial as he may be, he still passed this Russian invasion through the, their parliament. And if there was that much dissent, and we know that the Russians are far from being cowards, then how come he's able to have this sort of support still this late in the day. If Russia so is going to implode, if Russia is going to implode from within, won't something so significant have to happen, or for instance, for regime change or anything like that to occur? Okay, so again, let us trace the, uh, the history behind the domestic affairs in Russia, itself, uh, in, uh, in Russia itself. Do you know how many Russian leaders have been killed or have come to some death in the last six months minimum? And it's the same thing. They are jumping off terraces. They are shooting themselves in the head, allegedly, together with their family members somehow. And nobody is investigating that. That should tell you that there is a there's much more than dictatorial force being in place in Russia. So that Russian people have not imploded till this point, or that there's not been an uprising, is because of the cohesion of the people by Putin and Putin alone. 
Okay, now remember why he started this war in the first place. He first got a, an extension for 30 years to be president of Russia. That was the first thing that happened after he had that next premier. That was the first thing he did. Then he got that extension at the floor of the parliament to say he's going to be president for another 30 years. So he didn't come as a shock. These were pre planned. Putin was losing face at home and he needed something for his people to get behind to justify his continued leadership of Russia. That is why we are where we are right now. It's just a justification of, of a lonely man who wanted to continue to pull wool over the eyes of his people to get him behind him and continue to give uh, a legitimacy to, to his leadership. Okay, so he's president, but he's not the leader of the people. He's president, and there's so much killings going on. And then, of course, their economy is not faring any better. There are only two things that Putin can continue to hold on to, not even power anymore, not even energy. If we tell the energy, they blasted the gas turbines, and everybody thought, oh, then the whole world will be in darkness and will be cold. But that's not even happening anymore. That has had no impact. So the only thing they can hold on to is to say, we are trying to get Ukraine to be part of Russia because it's our own territory. Secondly, we have this relationship with China. Those are the only two things that Putin can boast of. Even his military parade looks depleted. So there's absolutely nothing left for him other than these two causes, which he which is trying to justify his continued leadership of, of Russia. But how much longer can that be sustained? That's the question. Uh, which uh, is begging for an answer. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yinka, your energy international affairs analyst, who joined us from East Midlands in the UK for your contribution this morning. Thank you very much for having me, Mr. McCauley. After the break, Russia's defense ministry says its forces still advancing in Bakhmut, while Ukraine releases videos showing its troops advancing near Bakhmut. Details in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine here in Africa. South Africa says it will hold an independent inquiry led by a retired judge into an alleged arms shipment to Russia. A move the United States says it welcomes. The statement came after U.S. Ambassador to South Africa, Ruben Brigitte, told local journalists in a briefing that Washington believed a Russian vessel had uploaded weapons and ammunition from South Africa in December. If true, it'll be a possible breach of Pretoria's declared neutrality in the Ukraine conflict. In Parliament, President Cyril Ramaphosa neither confirmed nor denied the claim, but assumed the House that the gov assured the House that the government is looking into the report. We are all aware of the news that we all became aware of, of uh, the Lady R, and that whole matter, Honorable Stian Hazen, is being looked into. Apologies for being a little tardy. We remain committed. Meanwhile, U.S. State to, Department's uh, Deputy uh, Spokesperson Vedan Patel says the United States has serious uh, concerns about the docking of the sanctioned Russian cargo vessel at a South African naval port in December last year and has raised those concerns directly with multiple South African officials. The United States envoy to South Africa said he was confident a Russian ship had picked up weapons in South Africa in possible breach of Pretoria's declared neutrality in the Ukraine conflict. We remain committed to uh, our affirmative agenda of our bilateral relationship with South Africa, uh, one that is focused on the priorities the two governments share, priorities that the recent high-level delegation to Washington discussed. Uh, these include issues of global peace and security, uh, further growing the robust trade relationship, working together on shared a shared health agenda, finding uh, ways in which 
uh, we, the United States, can be helpful to South Africa's energy challenges through a just transition of renewable sources of energy, as well as uh, continued partnerships on uh, work as it relates to addressing climate change. The U.S. Uh, has serious concerns about the docking of a r sanctioned Russian cargo vessel at a South African naval port uh, in December of last year. And as good partners do, uh, we have raised those concerns directly uh, with multiple South African officials, and I will, uh, I will leave it at that. It, it certainly would be a, a welcome uh, step, but uh, again, uh, you know, the deeply concerning piece of this is the uh, uh, the docking of a uh, sanctioned Russian vessel at a, a South African uh, naval port. Russia's defense ministry said in a daily briefing that Russian military forces are still advancing in Bakhmut. The Russian defense ministry said that its forces had continued to advance in the western part of Bakhmut and that paratroops were providing support around the Ukrainian city's flanks. The head of the Wagner private army, Yevgeny Prigazin, earlier said one unit of Russia's army had abandoned its supporting position and that Ukrainian forces had made gains towards the city as part of a long-awaited counteroffensive by Kiev. Meanwhile, Ukrainian 3rd Assault Brigade video, uh, sorry, released a video showing soldiers storming Russian positions near Bakhmut. Head of Russia's Wagner private army says the Ukrainian units had begun their counterattack and were approaching Bakhmut from the flanks, while Russia's defense ministry said its power troopers were supporting an advance on the west of the city. The assertions come amidst an escalating dispute between Wagner boss Yevgeny Prigozhin and the Russian defense ministry over the conduct of the invasion now in its 15th month. Prigozhin said that Ukrainian operations were proving to be, unfortunately, partially successful in an audio message posted on his Telegram channel. Now let's talk to Mr. Dennis Reva, Reva researcher, Institute for Security Studies, who joins us from Pretoria in South Africa. It's good to have you on the program this morning. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. You know, when an ostrich hides its head in the sand, it is thinking that its enemies will go away, but it forgets that its, its whole body is out in full view. I'm bringing this uh, to talk about this um, alleged uh, participation of, the, of South Africa in getting weapons to Russia, while in the same breath we have that particular issue of the Pentagon leaked documents that shows support for Ukraine by sending special forces into Ukraine from the US and the UK. And the US are now saying that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa should go ahead and they're happy that he's trying to investigate the report of this alleged um, uh, weapons from South Africa to Russia. What are your views? It's, it's very unfortunate for South Africa. I think um, I see the, the, uh, the comparison that you've drawn, but I think what's very important to note, or two things that are important to note right from the start is that South Africa's position on the war in Ukraine has been that of neutrality. And so, of course, uh, if South Africa is supplying weapons to uh, Russia, um, that would go against its position, and that would be quite challenging. Um, South Africa has been criticized by by Western countries for its uh, for, for for breaking with this neutrality. And, and of course, if it turns out to be true that South Africa has been supplying weapons to to Russia, that that would be very unfortunate. And I don't think that was um, that's something that would benefit South Africa and South African national interests. Um, uh, despite the growing relations with Russia, I think. South Africa's biggest trading partners and, and investment partners are European and uh, European countries and, and the United States. Um, I think it's also important to know that uh, from the leaked documents, as you rightfully mentioned, it, it, it was revealed that the US and UK uh, were sending special uh, special forces to Ukraine, uh, but it was it was determined rather it is it is seen that uh, the forces were sent to offer protection to to the embassy staff and it's unlikely 
that special forces actually took part in in battles uh, or or were deployed on the battlefield. So I think that's a very important distinction to draw. Uh, the 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 whole story was the the weapon supply or alleged weapon supply from South Africa is very interesting because uh, the whole situation happened last year December, and uh, the way it occurred was very interesting because um, um, the ship, the lady lady R. Um, it turned off its identification signal, so it, it went dark. And uh, it was not clear where the ship uh, was going. And all of a sudden, it appeared at the naval base in Simonstown in South Africa. And so uh, the military initially suggested that the ship was having some technical issues and, and um, it was all part of, of sort of offering the support to the ship, which made uh, no sense. This is not a usual procedure. Uh, the military then, uh, the South African Defense Force then clarified that um, the ship delivered a shipment of arms that was contracted, uh, was part of a contract between South Africa and Russia, which was signed before the start of the war, so before uh, the 24th of February 2022. And that was sort of the story. Now. I can tell you that unofficially, um, it, it has been there has been rumors and talks that uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, the U.S. were certain that South Africa supplied weapons to Russia, and that that exists for the past couple of months. So the fact that it's now became public, I think, means that, uh, or it seems to be that the U.S. ran into a a, a uh, sort of uh, they didn't they weren't getting uh, the responses from the South African government that they wanted and they decided to go public. So we'll see how this this issue develops. But it's I, I, I want to reiterate it's very unfortunate for the South African government and and the position that they take publicly. These these are for are you therefore saying that they have to strike a delicate balance with the United States and the European nations? and Russia as well, that is South Africa. Um, I believe that's the official position, that they, they strive to strike this balance. Um, as a non-aligned country, they, they believe that they have the right to engage with Russia while not actively supporting Russian efforts. So in right. that regard, I think um, supplying weapons would, would go against this position and, and would, um, would damage the relationship with the European Union and uh, the United States. What therefore do you see in the case of the UK, the supply of long range shadow missiles, cruise missiles to Ukraine as a significant escalation? I wouldn't call it an escalation necessarily. Um, these are sort of delicate uh, lines uh, and in comparison this is a bit difficult. I think South Africa right from the start, as I mentioned, um, maintained this non-alignment position and has been for the most part, very consistent in terms of, it, of its approach to, towards this war, uh, be it in the United Nations or the bilateral relations with Ukraine and Russia. Um, the UK supply of weapons, um, I think, comes as, as a different, well, essentially, I think, and I think your, your previous speaker spoke about it quite well. Essentially, um, um, the Western countries are committed to support Ukraine militarily. Uh, but they have drawn red lines that they are not ready to cross, and these are self, self, sort of self, uh, self-imposed restrictions that they've made. And I think there is an emergence of of realization in in, in the countries in the Europe uh, that he, it, it doesn't make sense to to supply to support Ukraine uh, uh, to a degree, but not to the full extent, because the war will then drag on, and it makes no sense. So. Um, I think there is a realization that uh, Ukraine needs these weapons, and um, if if it means that the war can be uh, can be uh, can come to an end at a at a sooner date, then these weapons need to be provided. Okay, so my point is that that red line seems to have been crossed by the UK, being that yes, as our earlier guest also pointed out, it's not um, realistic to think that Ukrainians will gung ho. Uh, fire deep into Russian territory, but what if that happens? You can't say it's a given that it won't happen if they have those weapons and if they are sufficiently and adequately provoked. Well, it's, it's again a very complicated question because technically uh, Ukraine has the right to strike 
uh, targets within Russia. This is a full-scale war, and, the, and the, if these are military targets, uh, Ukraine is is in, in right to do that. The concern has been that what happens if uh, Western-supplied weapons result in the deaths of uh, civilians in Russia, and that that is certainly not something that uh, they would they would want to to have. Uh, but uh, I see it as a as a test of trust. Um, you know, uh, Ukraine has long um, asked for long-range missiles to be delivered, and I, I think if Ukraine can show that these weapons will be used uh, responsibly, uh, responsibly in uh, targeting um, uh, targets within uh, what Ukraine considers to be its its legitimate territory, um, then other countries will follow the suit and and supply other long-range weapons. I mean, something similar happened with tanks, if you remember. Uh, the UK was one of the first countries to provide uh, Ukraine with with heavy tanks, um, and then other countries followed. Um, so, uh, um, but also to mention that the red lines that you mentioned, these I, I, I reiterate, these are self self imposed restrictions because um, the Western countries were concerned about civilian civilian uh, lives being lost, uh, people being killed by by Western made weapons. Um, so I think it's a test, and we'll see how how Ukraine fares. But I'm I'm certain that because Ukraine wants other countries to continue to supply weapons, um, they will be very careful about how they go about using these weapons uh, in this war. The position of neutrality of South Africa that you brought up is very interesting because we know that Russia is seen as the black sheep in this case. Uh, Putin is the bad guy, but if everyone supports militarily and in a very hardline position, Ukraine, and no one is neutral to be able to bring two sides to the table, then at the end of, this, of the day, what does this say of our human civilization? If people can't come together, if there's not someone or a, a group or a country that can be neutral and be sincerely neutral and not misleadingly neutral uh, in this case, is there not a, does that, does that not say that we're going down the wrong road, uh, speaking as human beings? Well, this is a very interesting uh, philosophical question. Uh, but I think uh, what the challenge here is that the war in Ukraine is sometimes portrayed as, as the war between two countries, uh, and it's not. Um, the war started with the invasion of, of Ukraine by Russian forces. Um, Russia has promised, or rather made statement, public statements before the start of the war, um, uh, that they, they've ensured the international public that um, they were not about to invade Ukraine, and, they, and then they invaded Ukraine. And in the process of invasion, Russia has also violated a number of international laws. Uh, they, the Russian soldiers have committed crimes against humanity, and now Putin himself is facing charges uh, for that. So I think um, it's not so much uh, a question of uh, whether, you know, other countries not involved in the conflict can be neutral. Uh, the question is, we have the, you know, we have the international system, uh, we have the international laws that ensure stability and peace around the world. And if one country violates these principles, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's to be expected that other countries will will not take a neutral position, um, there are, however, a number of countries that have taken a neutral position. I think China tries to maintain neutrality. India tries to maintain neutrality, and South Africa still, despite the allegations, I think have been quite has been quite consistent in terms of its approach, uh, despite a few um, we can call it hiccups uh, along the way. So I think. Um, as as um, the international uh, community continues uh, with with investigations of crimes committed in Ukraine, uh, as as we see the developments on the battlefield, it may become more difficult for countries to maintain neutrality, given the overwhelming evidence of the sort of uh, of the uh, actions of the Russian state in Ukraine and and the violations of international law. Uh, but. Uh, we, we do need, uh, of course, uh, any war will end in negotiations. We do need some sort of neutral party that would uh, that would mediate this the, the end of the war. Um, and you, you, I'm, I'm agreeing with you in that extent. So the Wagner Group now and the mercenaries, um, uh, 
Fregosin is uh, making a right um, spectacle of himself, well, according to some, given the way he is criticizing Russia's military and doing it in public channels, and he's threatened to withdraw from Bakhmut. Russia says if he does that, it's a treasonable offense. How much should, um, how much can Russia depend on the Wagner mercenaries? Well, uh, Prigozhin is a political animal. He uh, he maneuvers. He he uses the advantage that he has gained in Bakhmut um, to to gain more political support. Um, there were reports allegedly that um, the Ministry of Defense of Russia is not supplying sufficient uh, ammunition to Wagner Group, which which is what Prigozhin has been mentioning in his uh, numerous video and audio. Um, uh, uh recordings but uh it, it is it has been proven not to be the case um what seems to be what seems to have happened is that Prigozhin has lost his political support he used to enjoy a very high level of political support and and level of access to to high level of uh political elites including Putin himself it seems that he has lost this privilege now and what he's doing now i believe is trying to negotiate uh with uh, the sad political elites uh for for certain benefits for himself um from what we know is uh Prigozhin in, uh, the Wagner group has relied heavily on on the prisoners from the Russian prison systems and they were cut off from this uh system by the Ministry of Defense the Ministry of Defense now is recruiting prisoners and uh Wagner has been has been forbidden to do that so um I think what we're seeing is basically political maneuvering and, and political conflict within Russia between the elites trying to, to establish certain level of, of control and um, uh, certain people trying to regain their privileges. We want to be optimistic that there will come an end to this conflict down the road. Um, and I just uh, ran out of time. I, I, I wish I had enough time to ask you this very pertinent question, but we look forward to another day when we can do that. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for coming on the program. Uh, Mr. Dennis Riva, researcher, Institute for Security Studies from Pretoria and South Africa. Thank you for your thoughts this morning. Thank you for having me. When we return, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky expected to meet Pope Francis in the Vatican tomorrow. Please stay with us. Welcome back to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, as in all things, business is an important part of life and an important part of this conflict. Our correspondent, business correspondent, Ladi Williams, is with us in the studio. Yep. Ladi, good morning. Good morning, TGIF. Well, <laughs> well you know, not the, for in, everybody. In the shadow of, of, yeah. of this, of this uh, exactly. very sad conflict, we, yeah. hope that, uh, we, we hope that Russians and Ukrainians can say that very yeah, soon. Very soon. Of hopefully. every day that they have. Yeah. Now, Russian diamonds can soon be sanctioned. We know that um, we say diamonds are forever. Diamonds are forever. Russian diamonds are not forever. In and this a woman's case. best friend, but yes. not Russian diamonds. Uh, uh, if uh, this actually you know, pulls through, because we, we know the, um, the US, the EU, looking for uh, how to you know, stop Russia and, and most of these countries from circumventing the sanctions because with the sanctions, you know, we still see the, you know, Russian economy is still, you know, managing to stay afloat. They're still able to fund, you know, this war. And we know the EU and the US are looking for uh, ways to stop them from actually funding this war, funding that uh, Putin's war chest. And diamonds are a big part, you know, of that, uh, of exports from Russia. In 2022, they made about $1.5 billion exporting diamonds to EU countries. So at the end of the day, um, the EU has, has seen that this is a big um, part of their revenue, of Russia's revenue, and they need to find ways to you know, sanction Russian diamonds. 
the, uh, I guess the annoying part about these sanctions for the EU and the US is when they sanction um, Russian goods, um, they're still friendly countries that mm. accept you know, these exports. And somehow, these same exports find their way back to you know, the EU. So it's like, you know, damn if you do, damn if you don't, because you're trying to stop this war, you're trying to defund you know, Russia at this time, but there's still countries that are making it um, easy for Russia to sell most of their exports. So that's why we're seeing you know, the G7 coming together, find ways to you know, stop Russia and all these countries from you know, circumventing these sanctions. And it's not an easy um, task, mm. really, because it's a, it's a global village at the end of the day. And um, hopefully uh, they can find uh, ways to, to make this uh, happen, because if, uh, if Russia is able to you know, keep funding this war, it looks like the war might go on. Speaking of which, the G7 meeting in Japan to yeah. be held, um, how will those financial leaders in these countries be able to, to support Ukraine further? Yeah, so at the end of the day, they're still mulling more um, support for Ukraine at this time. We've seen um, countries like Switzerland, you know, for the first time actually joining, you know, in the, in the sanction process of Russia because we know um, Switzerland holds a, a big chunk of, their, um, of, of, of some of their funds as Russian funds, about $8 billion worth of that. So uh, we know, you know, Switzerland, they know for their secrecy with banking, but now they're <laughs> letting out uh, all of that information out so that, you know, at the end of the day, they can stop this, uh, f the, the funding of this war. But Russia keeps, you know, keeps going, you know, regardless of the sanctions. But the G7 leaders, are, they're thinking of more ideas you know, more ways to, you know, sanction Russia. Not, not an easy time. Isn't the Russia Swiss banker or... the most trusted? Exactly. <laughs> so, but now, for the first time, they're having to, you know, do away with that secrecy. Okay. Just, for, just for Russia, though. Just for Russia. Right. Thank you so much, Laddie. More business news on the program. A business morning after this program. Thank you so much, Laddie. Thank you. Now, finally... Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is expected to meet Pope Francis in the Vatican tomorrow. That's according to diplomatic sources. The planned trip, which has not been officially announced, comes just two weeks after the Pope said the Vatican was involved in a peace mission to try to end the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Since Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, the Pope has pleaded for peace practically on a weekly basis and has repeatedly expressed a wish to act as a broker between Kiev and Moscow. And that's it for today's special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. Thank you for watching. I'm Alumdia Macaulay. Do join us again at the top of next week for a new edition. Have a great weekend.